I want to pick up four big factors in the talk today. The first of these is a point that I hope there's not going to be fundamental disagreement about, which is to say East Asia is becoming increasingly interdependent economically and also institutionally. We're seeing a lot more trade across borders, a lot more foreign direct investment across borders, and we're also seeing the rise of many new Asian institutions that pull in the various countries across the region. A second point is that Northeast Asia in particular is still rife with tensions. So despite these moves that many would say should be leading toward reduced conflict, we still have lots of tensions and they continue to manifest themselves most recently perhaps with the Chinese movement of an oil rig into the South China Seas on territory that's claimed by Vietnam. A third point though is that even though we've got these tensions, we've not had any wars in Northeast Asia since 1953. There have been no shooting wars across national borders, no invasions, etc. And none in Southeast Asia since 1979 with the pullback of uh, China from Vietnam. So the East Asia region, while it's not free of tensions, is a country that, uh, or is a region that has managed to avoid absolute blatant war and conflict. The fourth factor, though, is something that's not historically rooted yet uh, and the one that becomes very problematic, and that is the rise of China. And we're seeing the increase in Chinese power, which I think is poising the region for a new regional order. We don't know the nature of that order, and that, in some respects, is what I hope we can spend some time talking about now. So what I want to do is talk about two very different stories. I want to talk about the first story, which is the positive economic and institutional linkage. Let me say a few things about this. I'm sure much of this material is, is familiar to many of you. But basically, a point that I would start with is that since the 1980s at least, the focus across most of the governments of East Asia has been on their economic development. The leaders in East Asia have essentially been freed up by the loss by the United States of the war in Vietnam to engage in exploring ways to cooperate with each other, exploring different economic models, moving toward their own economic improvement, engaging in closer economic ties, and importantly, I think, is the fact that most leaders in East Asia now gain their legitimacy, pivot their legitimacy on convincing their populations that if you keep me and my friends in power, I will make you richer, I will make your jobs better, I will make your kids have a better educational prospect, better jobs, better uh, uh, future prospects, etc. Unlike, keep me in power because I'll keep the enemies at bay, or I will invade the neighboring countries, or I will build up a military strength that you can be proud of. So there's been a real shift, I think, in that direction toward economics. And particularly, complementing this or supplementing this has been the rise in East Asian regional institutions that have, I think, also moved in the direction of economically and regionally positive relationships. The economic miracle that swept East Asia, I think, should be familiar to everybody. I don't want to uh, uh, beat this to death, but Japan, of course, 10% growth from 1955 to 1971, uh, then 5% growth or so till 1990. Japan, followed by South Korea, followed by Taiwan. Ultimately, the, um, the MIT economies, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, saw big improvements in their economic development. China, following the Deng Xiaoping reforms, 1978, has seen growth rates of close to 10% a year for the period since 1978. And basically, Vietnam has also chucked uh, pure communism and embrace doi moi, uh, also market-oriented uh, approaches. So all of East Asia, with the two conspicuous exemptions in the north of North Korea and in the south uh, with Burma or Myanmar, all of the countries, it seems to me, have essentially opted in the direction of focusing their legitimacy on economic development. The result of this is a big jump in Asia's share of world GDP from 4% in 1960 to about 30% today. The end result of this was uh, a succession of rapid growth rates that led many to predict that the 21st century would be the Asian century, and of course was a big part of Obama's notion of a pivot to Asia or a repositioning toward Asia so that the US 
could be in a position to help participate in, benefit from Asia's decades. And basically, what we're seeing is lots of East Asian countries investing in one another, trading with one another. And the story is basically that intra-Asian trade has jumped from about 39% in 1990 to now being as close, uh, almost close to the EU with about 57% of Asian trade being intra-Asian trade. So all of this has been the result of foreign direct investment and increasing movement of products. Into all of this comes the rise of China. And uh, this, of course, started with the decision by the Nixon administration to try to drive a wedge between the previously assumed to be part of a block of communist hegemony uh, challenging the United States with Russia and China, taking advantage of the splits between Russia and China, normalizing relations with China, and creating a tripolar as opposed to a bipolar East Asia, one in which the United States, China, and the Soviet Union provided three pillars of the tripolar arrangement. And Japan very quickly jumped into the fray and normalized relations with, uh, with China as well and helped to catalyze the mammoth economic growth that China has seen, particularly since Deng Xiaoping's uh, reforms in 1978. Again, repeating things that I am sure are familiar to many of you, China has now replaced the United States as the major export destination for virtually all of the East Asian countries. Until the mid to late 1990s, even into the early 2000s, the United States was the major destination for exports from Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, etc. Now, China is the number one uh, destination, and it's also become a major destination for the foreign direct investment. So that's the economic part of the story, all of which I'm suggesting pulls Asia together in largely cooperative ways. The second part of part one of the story is the increasing reliance on Asian regional institutions. ASEAN's been in place since 1967. Uh, it's been somewhat soft, somewhat weak in its secretariat, often criticized as a talking shop, but it's been there and it's also been pushing increased regional cooperation with uh, Northeast Asia, starting with the ASEAN plus three and pulling in South Korea, Japan, and China. Uh, subsequently, the ASEAN plus three has moved to put in place the Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization, a cross border currency swap that has now continued to increase in size and significance and independence from the IMF. Uh, all of these things have uh, moved forward. Most of them have moved forward since the financial crisis of 97, uh, 98. So Asia has moved, I think, rather systematically to create more and more institutions, including lots of cooperative institutions on functional areas in Northeast Asia. And we've also seen a big rise in free trade agreements so all of this basically composes the first half of the story, the, the sort of good story that says Asia are getting more cooperative. The flip side, though, is that there are still huge security tensions across the region. Uh, certainly, the tensions on the Korean Peninsula have not abated. They go up, they go down, but they are still quite severe. And we know about the sinking of the Chonan, the uh, Yongbyon-do shelling. Uh, there's a possi possibility of a uh, fourth nuclear test. Missile tests continue to go on, etc. cetera. Uh, there is still a lot of tension between Taiwan and the PRC, although it's been slow to materialize in the last couple of years, and it's been quiet. But we've certainly seen a lot of contestation in the last few years, last three or four years, about the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Uh, so as I said up here, East Asia is not singing kumbaya together. There are lots of ways in which Different countries do not like each other, do not want to cooperate. They may be cooperating um, on one level, but as Steph Haggard uh, put it in a phrase that I like to use, if there's peace in East Asia, it's the peace of the prudent. These are countries that have lead whose leaders have decided, we don't want to get in conflict with each other, but we don't, we, we don't really like these other guys. So it's still what uh, Aaron Friedberg called the cockpit of great power rivalry very much worried about endogenous threats. The easy way to understand this is to say that all of the guns in East Asia are aimed at other East Asians. Uh, there is no external enemy against whom East Asia is trying to protect itself. And 
So basically, we've got a situation in which Russia, China, the United States, and now North Korea are all nuclear powers. Uh, Japan still has a pretty substantial military. So does the ROK. North Korea is clearly at the heart of some of the big tensions. Uh, military glorification. Uh, those of you who follow the Korea Peninsula issues would say that the military is being downplayed a little bit more in favor of the party. But this is still a regime with a very powerful military in which uh, the military gets a big chunk of the budget and a big chunk of the food and, uh, and a big chunk of the official ideology. Um, spy ships being sent out uh, and, in this case, captured within Japan. Uh, Japan now has one of these in, uh, in one of the museums in downtown Tokyo with big signs saying, be wary of the North Koreans, you know, they're ready to attack at any moment, which plays into Japanese nationalism, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but North Korea is this bizarre mix of a very heavily freighted military with sophisticated nuclear power on the one hand and a terribly backward economy on the other. Uh, we've seen a very hard line from the North Korea, I think, in the last uh, uh, year or two since Kim Jong-un took over. Uh, he does seem to be trying to be both a push both the nuclear power but also economic reform. But certainly the, um, there has been no pushback, it seems to me, against the military. The succession seems to be very deeply uh, entrenched. There is a very clear line of legitimacy that centers around the Kim family. And I think the execution of uh, Jang Sun Tech really does tend to underscore the idea, the message that I am in control and don't any of you think that you're in a position to challenge me. I'm ready to execute my uncle, so don't feel that you're in a position to, uh, to provide any challenge. And it seems to me that this is all very, uh, very indicative of a provocative North Korea. Uh, China's rise, uh, lots of ways to think about this. I'm sure you've got your own uh, your own uh, handy tools for figuring this out. But it seems to me one way to think about this is to know that every year the rise in employment in Japan's, in China's modern sector is about 25 million people. That essentially means adding a middle-sized country to the world economy every year. So this is a huge measure of success, but it's a huge challenge or threat to the Chinese leaders. They have to keep providing jobs that are going to be uh, adequate and interesting and challenging enough for the increasingly anxious younger generation. The PRC's military buildup started out by emphasizing modernization. We have uh, had a very underdeveloped military for a long period of time. It's time for us to move to a more modern military. Uh, but China also engaged in missile tests when it was confronting a possibly more independent Taiwan in 96. Uh, they've passed a law that requires intervention against Taiwan should Taiwan act too independently. And it seems to me clear that China's long-term goal is enhancing its regional influence. Whether it does that through force or coercive diplomacy or through economic means is, I think, still the open question. But there's been a tipping of the balance in the direction of more uh, use of military force. Here's my take on China's strategy. Uh, it seems to me, with the articulation of the so-called nine-dash line and the development of the notion that this is now a part of China's core interest, uh, it is a very clear expansion of their claims, challenging UNCLOS and other notions of how um, economic, uh, exclusive economic zones are created. Uh, they put in place the Asia Defense uh, information zone in December of 2003, insisting that certain areas were theirs uh, that cut into the Korean and also the Japanese uh, claims of territorial uh, and air control, took over the Sh Scarborough Shoals in 2012. And basically, I think the Chinese strategy lately has been to push forward very slowly, push outward in ways that do not create a conflict, but that continue to expand China's influence and as part of this, I think we've seen the um, increasing moves toward A2, AD, asymmetrical warfare. China knows that in a head-to-head -head battle with the United States, it would lose. It suggests that it would gain parity with the United States only in 2050. That's still a long way off. 
but in the interim, anti area access, the anti access area deniability is the A2AD strategy, which essentially means if there's a conflict in which China's involved and America gets too close, we can make things nasty for you if you're in our neighborhood. We can shoot down your planes or we could knock, knock out some of your uh, aircraft or some of your ships. So we at least have the capacity to prevent a repeat of your moving ships in the seventh, uh, moving the seventh fleet through the Taiwan Straits, for example, if we get into a conflict with Taiwan. Importantly for the future of East Asia is the relative diminution of Japan. So China's rise comes not only at the expense of the United States, but also at the expense of Japan. Japan managed huge growth from 7% of world GDP in 1970 to 18% in the early 1990s. It's now back to 8% after 20 years of slow to no growth. So this has been a very big negative for Japan. It's basically in the last two decades erased all of the successes that it achieved in the 70s and 80s. Uh, China has now passed Japan in terms of GDP, as we all know. Uh, and I think a big part of the economic torpor that Japan is facing has led to a manifestation of an increased nationalism within Japan. It started particularly with Koizumi. Uh, it's been more manifested now with Abe. It triggers or it centers around Yasukuni Shrine, but it's also about historical revisionism about denying the actions of Japan in the Korean uh, occupation uh, and in the, Korea, in, in, in the war in China. Uh, so we've got all these old veterans marching around Yasukuni. Uh, we've got the Yushukan Museum next door, which has a very peculiar treatment of history, the essence of which seems to be that World, Wars II, World War II started with the unprovoked attack by the United States with atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Japan did nothing to lead to this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So a very bizarre historical interpretation. We've got this peculiar situation of close economic ties among Japan, Korea, and China. Uh, we've had the trilateral meetings going on until Abe took over that allowed for the three leaders to meet and cooperate and try to deal with some of the tensions on economic security, environment, uh, educational cooperation, etc. Those meetings are now no longer on the table, and I think it's led to a, uh, an increased set of tensions across Northeast Asia. Into all of this, of course, comes Obama's Asia pivot. Uh, the idea being the United States took its eye off East Asia for too long, focused much too heavily on the Middle East and on Central Asia. It's time for the United States to get back to a greater attention to Northeast Asia and East Asia. There's certainly a great deal of emphasis on the military side of this, but I think it's important to recognize that at least in the articulation as it's presented by Washington, it also includes America's embrace of economics in the region, America's uh, welcoming of multilateralization. It includes America's participation in uh, the um, East Asia Summit, the improvement of relations with Myanmar on economic terms, ending sanctions on Myanmar, uh, re-engaging, etc., trying to come to some better balance with China. The ideal American, this is just uh, the clear indication that lots of American officials are spending more time in Asia than uh, was true of the Bush administration. But of course the biggest challenge is China, and China now has moved, as I said, toward a much harsher approach to regional activity than before, moving away from its previously central focus on its domestic economy. So I think the US faces some serious challenges in Asia that Obama's pivot is trying to deal with. The first of these is that phrase, engagement. Uh, the American strategy is a mix of hedging or containment of China with also deep engagement of China on diplomatic activities, economic activities, and trying to balance both of these in different ways. Uh, I suggested that there are two different triangles operative in East Asia. One is what you might think of as a, an economic engagement triangle, which is China, South Korea, and Japan. And that's the economic front. But then there's a containment or a hedging triangle, which is the South Korea, Japan, US relationship which, uh, uh, and the two of them are designed, I think, to maximize the U.S. influence in Asia, try to contain China's 
growth and enhancement in ways that are got, not going to challenge the rest of the region for security. But a big challenge for the United States remains Japan. Will Japan be able to resuscitate its economy? Will Abenomics uh, be capable of revitalizing Japan and allowing Japan to play a larger economic role in the region? Or is Abe and is Japan and is the LDP going to concentrate primarily on reinterpreting history, using its political capital to revise the Constitution, or to uh, spend a lot of time denying previous apologies or qualifying previous apologies? And it seems to me, so far, the, the movement on TPP has been very ambivalent. I think if you look at the Obama administration's trip, uh, they were happy with many things about the trip. They were very unhappy about Japan's failure to move forward on the TPP. So that's, uh, that's still a difficult issue. Uh, and basically, I think it's, it's the, the tricky part of this is that it's going to be very difficult to acknowledge. We, we need to acknowledge the abstract that China's going to rise. China will have different interests. Not everything that's operating today is going to be seen by Chinese leaders as in their best interest. They're going to want to see some changes in the rules. One of the rules that they want to see changed is the rules for waiting <coughs> voting power in the IMF. The United States was prepared to enhance China's role in this regard, Japan's role in this regard, Korea's role in this regard. But the American Congress has been stalled on this and has refused to allow a rebalancing because somehow this looks like a free good to a belligerent China. So the Chinese leadership is now in a position to say, we're not so sure that the American institutions, the institutions that the Americans created after World War II, are really going to be flexible enough to allow for uh, China to move comfortably within them, we need to set up our own institutions or to challenge uh, the existing status quo. But I do want to stress that there are areas for cooperation. Uh, there's a strategic and economic dialogue between the, the two countries. Uh, they meet regularly. The G20 has done a lot on economics. Uh, both sides seem to have a very strong interest in reducing the nuclear threat from North Korea, probably reducing the threat from uh, a nuclear Syria or a nuclear Iran. Uh, there's a lot of room for cooperation on Somali piracy. Both sides work very well in that regard. Uh, neither one is very happy with Muslim fundamentalism. We don't like it in Al-Qaeda. They don't like it in the Uyghurs in, uh, in Xinjiang. But there's room for cooperation on a lot of these things, including global, global climate change and energy. So with all of that, I think we need to keep the Asian security in perspective. Lots of tensions, but still no war. Lots of normalizing of ties, lots of setting of normal borders on the continental side, but the maritime borders are now becoming an issue. Uh, we've seen a general drop in the military budgets until the last two years. The last year or two, we started to see a kind of mini Asian arms race. Whether that's going to be the trend in the future or not, I welcome your thoughts and feedback on, but uh, it's clearly open to question of whether we're moving now in a direction that may be more problematic, more conflict prone, more open to coercive diplomacy than the past. But I also want to be very cautious about what I'd call theoretical teleology. Uh, that should turn off anybody with, um, with a practical mind. But uh, we, with the focus on power transitions, it becomes easy to listen to a John Mearsheimer story about how you know, uh, the Spanish replaced the Dutch after a war, and then the British replaced the Spanish after a war, and the British challenged the French in a war, and then the Germans challenged the British when they were uh, exercising power in the run-up to World War I. Japan also challenged the United States in the uh, Greater East Asia War, etc. But the reality is that the United States and uh, Britain went through a power transition in the late 19th century without war. Germany and Japan both rose very substantially in the post-World War II period economically without a war. And given the changing dynamics, I don't think we want to allow our current interpretation of events to be so shaped by what happened between the Dutch and the Spanish in the 15th or 16th century that we assume that war is inevitable. I think the real question is, can politicians manage this transition in a way that reduces tensions and moves us forward to areas of positive sum cooperation. It's not going to be easy, but I think the burden falls heavily on politicians, and I think they need to avoid assuming that they don't have options. There are options for the US to back off from possibly confr confronting. There's 
opportunities for China to back off, Japan can do the same, etc. So by way of a very broad and sweeping set of conclusions, we've seen positive moves in economics across East Asia, positive moves institutionally. All of those things should work toward functional cooperation, uh, toward reducing tensions. Uh, but we also have to deal with a rising China, and it's not clear what countries are prepared to accept in dealing with a rising China. Yes, we deal with rising China in the abstract. That means that you give up this and you give up that, but I give up nothing. Uh, that's not likely to be a message for success. So ultimately, um, I think it's going to be uh, necessary to fall back on political leadership as the mechanism by which these countries can try to come to accommodations to find areas where they can trust each other, cooperate with each other, and where they do have serious differences of opinion, serious core differences of interests, to try to resolve them in ways that are not necessarily going to lead to overt conflict and war.